Hey everybody and welcome back to Release the Fans, Emerald City Hockey's fan-based podcast. Podcast where we get to talk to you, the fans, the awesome members of the Seattle Kraken community, the ECH community. There we go, keeping the streak alive there with my awesome intros for these. Uh, really excited about today's episode though, we get to talk with Sarah here. It's going to be a lot of fun, talk about how you got into hockey, all that kind of stuff, how you became a Seattle Kraken fan, the entire journey of being a Seattle Kraken fan, as well as some other awesome tidbits. But got to start off with just, how's it going? It's great. I made sushi during the game the other day. It tasted delicious, and it's easier than I thought it would be. So it's unlocked this thing for me in the kitchen. That's very exciting. And now I'm excited to talk to y'all. Awesome. Awesome to hear it. Uh, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into hockey and become a fan? So I grew up in Dallas, Texas. So I wasn't quite a Stars fan, but my church group would, on the reg, get tickets to Stars games, which were pretty cheap during the 2003 to 2005 or so era. And so I'd go to Dallas Stars games pretty frequently. And the best part about that is if the Stars scored on a power play, everyone in the audience got a coupon for a free Taco Bell taco, nice. like just the basic nice. taco. But when you're a middle schooler and like the best part of your week is getting dropped off at the mall to hang out, like those coupons were absolute <laughs> gold. Um, and so like, I loved going to those games and, you know, being in the crowd, but grew up a little bit, didn't think too much about hockey until I was in Austin for college and I ended up dating a hockey player for a little bit, like a, like minor league stuff. Um, but at the time I just remember his favorite player was Ovechkin and like looking back on it now, that's a little bit basic <laughs> as a choice. <laughs> But for years after that, the only hockey thing I really knew was I used to love the stars and Alexander Ovechkin is like a big deal in hockey. And then now, two years later, the Seattle Kraken get a hockey team. My partner, Jeremy, loves hockey. He's loved it his whole life. He was an Atlanta Thrashers fan, oh, uh, which oh. was rough for yeah. him when that left. <laughs> Um, when he lived in Boston, he was a Bruins fan, but not a huge fan of that organization. And then he had this big drought because he's lived in Seattle for about 10 years now. And it's when the Seattle you know, area got the crack and he started to share his love of hockey with me. And it just became the sport that like really scratched that itch for me, like the way the game is played, how fast it is, the way the teams comprise, the kind of rock, paper, scissors of putting out different lines to combat and do different things like that all just was super interesting to me in a way no other sport had been. And I've just kind of been in love. And also he introduced me to y'all. Um, he had been listening to y'all's <laughs> um, podcast and show all of the first season. And it was when I think we started this season. It was like, OK, Sarah, you're like starting to get into it. You need to start watching ECH with me. And I'm like, Okay. Yeah. And I've learned so much. So y'all have only kind of helped me learn more and learn to love the sport even more. Awesome. Awesome. Love to, love to hear that. And yeah, big, big thanks to him for, I guess, introducing you to us yeah. and uh, I mean, I'll lead to this. That's really cool. Um, so now that you're a Kraken fan, I, I think pretty firmly a Kraken fan, I see by the jersey you're wearing. What is your favorite part of being a Kraken fan? Oh, that's, that's such an awesome jersey. And we will talk about yes. that later. Got to get to that. But what is your favorite part of being a Seattle Kraken fan? I'm really lucky to be able to go to all the games. We have season tickets for like six seats away from the glass and we can see oh. all of the ice. So we we get to go to the games and like just being there, feeling the crowd and watching like the whole play develop. That was something that was really new to me was there's this huge difference between watching it on TV and you can only see whatever the camera's focused on. And sometimes you'll see a player holding a puck for a bit. And you're like, why are they doing that? But if you're at the stadium and you can see everything, you're like, oh, they're doing a line change. Like you can watch everything that's happening. So that helped me fall in love with it. But I also just love the sports community. Whenever I go into the office, I see the other folks wearing their Kraken gear. I've become the Seattle Kraken weekly update for a couple of the people I work with. They're like, oh, how are we doing? How's it going? I hear this season's better than last year. And I just, I love that bit as well, like how it allows you to connect to people. 
Yeah, I mean, that's one of the most special aspects about sports. I talk about how it's the ultimate reality show in the sense that it's the only truly unscripted thing out there. But it is also the community aspect that really makes all of this work and enjoyable because, you know, yeah, it could be great by yourself sitting at home. But yeah, if you get to go out to a bar and watch it with friends or you get to go and be at the game, it's so much more enjoyable. You get so much more out of it for sure. Yeah. All right. And then I also oh, just, go for it. Oh. Sorry, the only thing I'll add is I also just, I really like our players. The Seattle uh, social media does such a good job of like giving us tidbits of personality and kind of showing us who these guys are, just like watching them work so hard on the ice and like how much fun they are to watch. Like that's, that's a thing that's specific to our team that I just love. Like other teams, I'll watch them during the, you know, when they come to visit and I'm like, they'll never be as good as the guys <laughs> wearing our jersey. Yes. This yeah. And that's something. Jerseys. Yeah, I'm very lucky to be able to kind of see that every day. And I try and pass as much of that on, you know, to the fans as possible because, like, they need to see this stuff. It's great. Yeah. And I really like you bringing up the idea of, you know, one of the reasons why it's it's better in person is the ability to see the whole ice. Right. And you talked about, like, learning the game and all of that kind of stuff and, and what that can bring you, because I do think that that isn't something that gets talked about too often when, you know, say it's it's one of us and we're trying to get a, a new person involved in the sport or, or to to become a fan of, you know, hockey in general, any specific team, whatever it is. And you always think like, well, we all know it's 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 more fun in the arena because it's loud. You got all the fans cheering like there's just an energy about it that that you can't recreate on TV. Um, but I do think that that's also a good one of like, you know, let's say you've already kind of been bitten by that bug a little bit of like, OK, I've been to a game. It's a lot of fun. But now here's another reason to like kind of keep going back. It's because I can actually learn more about it and I can, you know, kind of enrich myself with some more in-depth knowledge that I can only pick up from being there and, and being in person. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So you're obviously Seattle Kraken fan. That has been well established now. But you're also a fan of tabletop RPGs, whether it's playing them, GMing them, whatever, right? Like you're you're into that. I absolutely love that. I'm a fan as well. So I got to ask, have you ever incorporated anything from the Kraken into a character or a game or like vice versa, brought any of that over into being a Seattle Kraken fan? Because that seems like a natural for me. <laughs> So I absolutely have. So I have, I have two answers to this. The first one is, so for folks who aren't aware, um, playing games like Dungeons and Dragons or whatnot, it's collaborative storytelling. So typically you have a group of maybe five people sitting around a table playing a game together. Uh, four of the people at the table will play a character. So they're taking on a persona, they're making choices, they're trying to be someone else and maybe have a stat sheet and you roll some dice. And then the other person at the table plays the world and their job is to like present the players with challenges and obstacles and just interesting things to interact with. And so I like to do both parts. And as you can imagine, this involves a lot of improv. And one of the most stressful parts of improv is coming up with good names for like, oh, I go and I talk to the bartender, what's their name? And prior to actually getting really into hockey, I uh, would blank. And it would be this huge stressful thing every time. And now it's like, oh, it's a, a Mr. Wemberg is polishing a glass <laughs> or, um, you know, my character steps out of a vehicle and thanks Mr. McCann, the driver uh, for, you know, getting her there. Um, or a couple weeks ago, my players encountered a pair of guards named Alexiak and Borgen. So now it's like <laughs> having all of these like names to be able to draw from. And then also, a little bit of the personalities and a little bit of what I know from seeing them on the ice, which is so much fun. Um, but y'all will get a kick out of this. Back in February, the Kraken had an away game uh, for the New Jersey, or they played the New Jersey Devils. Mm -hmm. It was an away game. And y'all put out a tweet after the game that was one of our players with all five of the New Jersey's Devil players around that um, player. I think it was Maddie, but I'm I not. I think it was Maddie. Sure. I remember that. <laughs> and um, y'all drew a pentagram around the five players. And I looked at that in one that gave me this huge laugh, but it also made me think, what if I ran a D&D &D game where all the players were at an all-stars game? Nice. And due to... Oh. <laughs> 
due to like the actions of the crowd or the players on the ice, ancient cosmic horrors got summoned uh, that they needed to be dealt with or defeated through hockey skills or, or something like that. So I've been working on writing a game that's Call of Cthulhu and it incorporates cosmic horrors from beyond the veil, but also at a hockey all-stars game um, with like fake made up hockey teams. I've been working with friends on that. I have a bunch of friends in D&D who also love hockey. Nice. So this has become kind of a running gag and fun thing for the group. Awesome. Oh that my gosh. Awesome. That answer is way better than I could have expected. That is fantastic. Really. <laughs> oh man. I, that, that is awesome. That's going to be great. Yes. Um, that, that's yeah. Cause I like, I knew we had that question planned too. I wasn't expecting so much to like transfer over to everything. I bet that's a handsome bartender Wenberg too. Um, it's cool to like play a little bit of the personalities in. So we, we kind of touched on this a little bit with like your unique style of, of being a fan, but I mean, that's kind of the next question. Like what is your style of fandom? And I guess you, you touched on a bit there, but also just kind of being at games. Everyone's a little bit different when they're watching. Like what, what is that for you? I'm a lean forward all the way, completely absorbed in what's happening, don't talk to me sort of person when the puck is in play. And then, you know, when we're done leaning over and asking questions, I think that was offsides. I think that was icing. Ooh, what do you think the call is there? Because uh, I love to learn. Like, I'm an enthusiast. I just mm -hmm. love to jump into loving things with both feet and I also love sharing that with other people. It's like whenever me and Jeremy can't go to games, we try to give tickets away. Mm -hmm. And pretty much everyone we've given tickets to like now has bought a jersey and is now going to other games because they like caught that bug at the game. And that just fills me with so much joy. Oh, You're yeah. doing good work there. <laughs> Definitely. That is what it's all about. And I, I love that. I'm very much the same way like puck is in play i am focused and i am staring at something it may not always be the puck or anything associated with that but i've <laughs> i've definitely zeroed in on something and somebody out there uh so i definitely understand uh now to get back to maybe like even just the jersey you have on right now want to know if you have a favorite Kraken player, it's acceptable to say all of them. I understand that. Uh, you know, any player jerseys, why did you choose them? You know, any of those kinds of things? All the boys have a very okay. special place in my heart. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but the top position uh, is Jared McCann. So nice. on the uh, Pride Night where we played the Dallas Stars about a month ago, mm -hmm. ooh, or three weeks ago, who knows? Um, I so many games against the up. stars. I mean, who can keep track? And one right after, after the other, too. Yeah. Um, I picked up the pride jersey for this nice. year with his number on it. I was really happy that it didn't get totally out of control, but it all goes to a really good cause. Mm -hmm. And um, I just I really love the way that he plays. He's always very noticeable when he's on the ice. Um, I picked up my first McCann jersey last year. Um, the week he signed his contract, I had never bought a jersey for any player for any sport ever before. And Jeremy kept asking me, like, who are you going to pick up? Who do you want to buy? Because, you know, the moment you pick a player, I'm going to go buy you a jersey. And I was like, really kind of stressing out over this choice. Pressure. Like, I wanted... Yeah. Right. And it was like, it meant a lot. And it means still a lot to me. And um, I just wanted it to be a player who, like, I felt like I liked as a person, but also on the mm -hmm. ice but also someone who would be around for a few years because yeah. jerseys are expensive. Yeah. yeah. And then he signed the, he signed the contract and it was like, okay, I'm getting a canner Jersey. So I've got the 16 from last year nice. and then now a 19 for this year. Uh, I absolutely Perfect. love that. Yeah. And you know, I mean the 16 canner jerseys, those are going to be cool for a while too. Like talk about being, you know, OG with the Seattle Kraken. That's, that's pretty cool. I actually also have a reverse retro jersey that's Tanf okay. for that one. Um, okay. I know I wanted to do a different one, and like he's another player where like when he's on the ice, oh, you yeah. know that he's oh, yeah. on the ice. <laughs> when he gets up and goes and like chases down a puck to like win an offsides challenge, like that, oh. or not a, a, an icing challenge, like that's incredible to watch. He's so much fun. Yeah. Oh, oh I, for sure. I approve. With my uh, what was Tanavera. yeah? What was your reaction when uh, McCann decided to change his jersey number when you heard about that? I I actually remember I 
I had read about him the first year um, when I was like researching which player I wanted to get a jersey for. And I already knew that he preferred the number 19. Um, and that had kind of been his jersey number because it has a lot of personal significance to him. So I wasn't surprised uh, when he changed. And I was actually really happy for him because he prefers to be with that number. I'm going to proudly stick with my inaugural season 16. But I'm very happy for him that he was able to switch. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the 16, that OG jersey, everyone's always going to see that. No, that's the inaugural season one. I'm sure it's got that inaugural season patch on it, too. Um, yep. Yeah, no, that's going to be great. Now, on to the jersey you have now, because now you've got the 19 also. You've kind of completed the set there, unless he makes another jersey number change. Hopefully he doesn't. Um, but you're set for the time being. But yep. uh, I, I wanted to kind of shift focus to something having to do with the jersey you're wearing and a topic that I think has been relevant this month, especially with, with Women in Hockey Night, with Pride Night and, and, and some of the jerseys. And inclusivity has definitely been a theme that's been talked about quite a bit. And so I'm curious, how have the Kraken and kind of the hockey community made you feel welcome as a fan? And what can they do to help other fans like you feel welcome? This is a great question. And I also, I love that it's something y'all aren't shy about asking. That's something I've really appreciated about y'all's coverage in particular is that these are things you clearly care about and you're caring about them in a very loud and a very visible way. So first, you know, keep doing that good work. I feel very welcome in this community. And also, you know, thank you to everyone in the Discord. I'm not super active, but whenever I pop in, it's always wonderful to see folks. And I always lurk in game chat when there's a uh, radio or when I'm listening to the radio broadcast and kind of watching people's comments who are watching the show. But as far as the organization is going, I've been really impressed with the Seattle Kraken because they're they're doing a couple of big and small things right for me. So first we have the big showy, flashy events. You have the Pride Night, you have the Women in Hockey Nights where all of the players put on their jersey and there wasn't a fuss. And also I wasn't worried that it was going to be a headline the next day that someone made a unfortunate choice and we don't need to get into any of that. Um, and these are things that are so important for fans to interact with because most people who buy tickets to a game probably have no idea that there's a theme night going on. Mm -hmm. So it's awesome for just kind of a regular person to walk in and go like, okay, it's Pride Night. Um, I don't know how I feel about that, but okay, my hockey team's wearing Pride jerseys. And it's just something they get to think about. Um, same thing for the Women in History Night. But the other things the team is doing so well, um, the designer of the Lunar New Year uh, mm -hmm. jersey for this year, and then the designer of the Pride jersey last year, both of them are non-binary individuals who use they, them pronouns. And that's in the ad packages. That's on the promotional materials when they talk about the different jersey designs. That's so important. The organization didn't have to do that, but it looks really intentional the way that they're selecting people from the community and who they're highlighting at these games because non-binary people exist. They're in your communities. They're people who are just your neighbors. And seeing these people just up on the Jumbotron at a game with how many people can Climate Pledge hold? It's 17,151. Yeah, there we go. And like most games are sold out or somewhere near it. So you've got 17,000 people, you know, seeing this on the Jumbotron, like that's incredible. Um, I also did a little bit of digging on the Kraken org, not too much, but mm -hmm. if you go and look at their board of directors page, four out of their 10 people on their board of directors are women. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, that's a lot better than some of the other hockey organizations that I went and looked at. Cause I, I thought, oh, you know what? Oh, yeah. I wonder how they're doing in comparison to other franchises that are a little bit newer that have maybe even established under more modern sensibilities. And like, that's super cool. and. We also just had a woman join the um, group of owners for the team, and she'll be joining the board of directors for the NHL or the board of um, governors. I think it's governors. Yeah. The board of governors. Yeah. And I don't know, y'all have probably seen pictures of the board of governors meeting. <laughs> 
it's yep. <laughs> pretty grisly if you're um, a woman or a person of color. Um, but it's fantastic that like our organization um, has another woman who will be able to go and be a voice in those rooms. So, like mm -hmm. the Kraken's doing the big stuff really well, but then is also doing the little things incredibly well. So I'm I'm very proud of this org. No, I lo I love that you're highlighting the some of those more behind the scenes aspects of things, right? Like you had to go out and you you research that stuff and you know, you were pleasantly surprised by what you found, but that's not something that the team is like, "Hey, you know, check this out about us trying to be all flashy." Like they're just trying to do it because they think it's the right thing to be doing and these are the best people for the job and all that other stuff and uh it's it is a big deal and so i do appreciate you bringing that up and yeah i always think that it's important i love that the kraken do all the different nights that they do i think that that's so much fun whether it's for a really you know important cause or even stuff just like highlighting and having fun with like the lunar new year right like that's still a lot of fun and it's something for fans to get involved in and it is representation for some people and there's just so much good around it. I love that the Kraken are all about doing that kind of stuff. And we get awesome warm-up jerseys to come out of it. I like I love that too. I love seeing the artwork that comes out of that kind of stuff. I love seeing the artists highlighted. Like it's really, really cool. And I am I am definitely, you know, I, I am very, very happy that uh, we get to cover a team that, you know, embraces all of that stuff so much. It's it's a big deal for me. Have either of you had a favorite themed night that they've done so far? That might be tough to oh. answer. I know for me, I always love when they bring the little kids out yes. to mm -hmm. play a game on the ice during the intermissions and, um, you know, highlighting teams from different potentially marginalized groups within the community is so much fun. But I just I love watching the peewee hockey. It's it's so delightful. It's it's always the the top one. I feel like watching them whether they're coming out and they're doing like a little scrimmage or like some sort of pond hockey setup or just a shootout. That is definitely always number one for me. I don't know. It's hard. You you both have been to so many more Kraken games than I have, <laughs> being stuck down right. here. So uh, yeah, I mean, I would agree with that. I don't know what other, what is some of the other stuff they do. I mean, does Bowie ever get involved in the intermission activities? Um, yeah, he does. He definitely does. I mean, he'll, he'll help out. He'll tip the scales a little bit sometimes, okay. you know, cause he's a bit chaotic, but like, as for the theme nights, I, I love the kids night too. They don't like do jerseys for kids, kids night or anything, but I love seeing young fans get into the game. Um, I, I think my favorite still is, is women in hockey night. Like yeah. that's, I don't know, just my personal favorite of the theme nights. Uh, cause there are so many impressive women in the organization and also like, you know, around us that we see every single day. So um, and also, I wanted to mention a couple on the hockey ops decision making side too. Alexander Mandricki and Namita Nandakumar, like yes. their decisions affect the on ice product so mm -hmm. much. And it's something that maybe you don't see all the time as a fan, but it's it's really important. Yeah. That was another thing when I was looking up, uh, once again, you can go and see the kind of people who are a part of hockey operations for all of these different organizations. And it was really, really refreshing to see that there are multiple women who are a part of the um, kind of behind the scenes cracking organization who aren't administrative assistants. Um, that's that's the case yeah. for a lot of these orgs. And those are still very important jobs, but it's very different when an org says, we have women in our organization, but then you look in there and kind of those roles that are classically relegated to women versus they are a part of the analytics team making key decisions that impact what happens on the ice. Like that's incredible. And then you've got Allison and Piper also doing super visible, super incredible work. Like they're out there. It's so great to see them and they're fantastic. Oh yeah, having oh, yeah. Allison, uh, especially as part of those broadcasts, doing doing the 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 job that she does, bringing forth the information that she has, uh, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Piper is phenomenal. I love the uh, the intermission interviews. I know you you know both of you get to be at the games, all that kind of stuff. You don't get to see them. I get to see them. Uh, they are fantastic for sure, for sure. And yeah, when you talk about like the NHL as a whole, one of the things that you know, was always surprising to me was how little representation all of the teams had from women, you know, whether it's in their front office or higher up on the business side of things, just because the NHL forever has, you know, 
touted and and it is true had the largest percentage of female fans but it never seemed to you know lead to anything for as far as opportunities for women within the nhl or within these franchises and so you know it's it's really awesome to see the seattle kraken kind of take that seriously and 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 we can see that like that actually means something to them and and it is you know when half your fan base is female you want to represent that, right? Like you want to have people like that around. Uh, it makes sense. And uh, I, I'm happy that they're doing it for sure. Uh, you you kind of asked a question in there. We're going to transition into the open discussion segment here. You get to ask us questions. I mean, go for it. We got a little bit of a sneak peek at some of these anyway. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. So, so fire away when ready. Okay, so my first one, I clearly love stories and storytelling. I play a bunch of Dungeons and Dragons, and it's there's something about sitting with a group of people and experiencing something happening uh, that's just magic. So I wanted to ask y'all, what's your favorite either story in Kraken franchise history or the NHL more broadly? Uh, something that you just absolutely love talking about. No, this is such a tough one, RJ. I mean, do you want to do you want to go first? Do you have something super specific? Sure, I'll, I'll start it out. Okay. And um, this is a story from last season, uh, and it's still one of my favorite stories from covering this team because it's just such a, a weird one. Um, but it comes from a a Kraken practice on a day that really like nobody went. It was probably the least attended practice I've ever been to. It was at Climate Pledge Arena back when they practiced there, and. So during the practice, uh, we're watching and Chris Drieger just doesn't look quite right. I don't, to me, I'm watching, it's me, Everett Fitzhugh, John Forslund, and I think JT, and that's it. Like there's nobody else there. And, and Mike Benton came kind of at the very end, but that's it. Very lightly attended practice. And to me, Drieger just doesn't look quite right. Now, if you remember back to last season, like, he just could not catch a break. Like he, yeah. he had COVID, I think, for a bit. He finally strang a couple good games together and then he got injured. And then it's just, it was this whole thing where he couldn't get it together. And so he just didn't look quite right to me. The way he was going down, the way he was making saves seemed a little bit off. And he seemed more tired than usual too. Like he was kind of hunched over, like he was breathing a little heavy. And so I mentioned to the other guys there and I was still kind of shy about talking to them because I was still kind of new on the scene. I'm like, hey, does, does something look a little bit off about Chris Drieger to you guys? Like, is he is he hurt? Is he laboring a bit? And Fitz right away is like, don't put that out there into the universe. This is the last thing we need is for Drieger to be hurt again or something. So don't even speak. I'm like, all right, all right. And then they were watching him a little bit further. And like, yeah, no, I don't think he's off. He seems fine. Look, he just made this great save on the players and he's stopping their shots. There's nothing wrong. So at the end of practice, um, Drieger is skating away and he's again, looks kind of tired. And then he takes his mask off and he is bald, like completely bald head, <laughs> no facial hair, nothing. And we're all like, what, what did, <laughs> and I, I think force was like, what did Chris Drieger do last night? You know, where was he? <laughs> and we couldn't believe what we saw. And we just saw the back of his head. So we were like, what is going on? And he turns around and we see his face and that's not Chris Drieger at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're like zooming in, trying to see who this guy is in his face. And we recognize him after a few seconds. That's Andrew Allen, the goalie coach, the 51 year old goalie coach was filling in for Chris Drieger that day. And we just were floored. We could not believe it. I mean, for, John Forslund was like the most floored of anyone, too. And he's seen some things in hockey. And he's like, that is an all timer. I have never seen anything like that. And, you know, if he's saying that, that it's it's pretty great. And so I, I love I forget which who it was that said it. But he's like, all right, who looks worse here? Us who couldn't tell the difference between Chris Drieger and Andrew Allen in net. Chris Drieger, that we could confuse him for the goalie coach, potentially. Or the players who couldn't score on him. That's the thing. He should have been getting lit up, but he was actually making some really good saves. Andrew Allen was. We looked him up. Like he, I think his highest level of hockey was the ECHL or something, and he's over 50. Um, it was just a crazy moment in kind of a crazy season. So that's that's my story. That's It's still so funny. <laughs> and it's, it's, <laughs> it's just highlighted by, by Forslund there and, and everything there. I mean... 
Oh, that's a good good Kraken one. I don't I don't know that I can like match you Kraken wise, so I think I have to go uh, outside of the Kraken. And there's so many hockey stories that I've been a fan of over the years. I've always been interested in you know history in general. Both you and I, RJ, both share that kind of passion. Yep. Uh, hockey history. There's so many fascinating things. Whether you go back to the early days of the Stanley Cup and it getting you know lost out on a frozen lake and you know or and needing to be repaired at random you know body shops across Canada at various times. Uh, there's all the fun stuff like that. So I'll always go back though to like the early days of kind of like the globalization of hockey as like you know European players are starting to become more prevalent. You have the Soviet Union as a force. I still recommend every. Everybody go and uh, learn about the 72 Summit Series where Canada's kind of like bubble was burst by the Soviet Union that, hey, you know what? Other people play hockey and other people can play hockey well. I still think everything around that is is one of the most fascinating things from hockey. But my all time favorite specific moment, and I, I might have talked about this before, is the Paul McLean getting fired by the Ottawa Senators. He was the coach of the Ottawa Senators. Let me see what year it was that he was he was let go by them, but he was a the coach there for a little while. Uh, he was the coach of the Ottawa Senators from, where is this? It was in 2014. So December 8th, 2014, McLean was fired from his position as head coach of the Senators, and he had the greatest hockey press conference of all time because, like, this was something that was kind of known. Everyone figured it was coming. All the reporters are there. They're covering it, but no one's really, like, that enthusiastic about it. They're not really asking him questions, so it's a very awkward press conference as he's having to, like, say goodbye but like no one's really giving him anything to work with it was very strange and so during one of his many kind of reaches just to like kind of fill the silence was he talks about you know having to just you know as his daughter would say shake it off shake it off and he kind of like does a taylor swift impression nothing dead silent like nobody laughs nothing it's the most awkward thing in the world and then to break the silence some person <laughs> Some, some woman breaks in through the back and just screams, We love you, Paul McLean! <laughs> and and that just completely random security drags her out immediately, like gets dragged out, all this stuff. Everybody's just like, what is happening? And he just goes, I promise that's not my daughter. And it's just the best. <laughs> it's, the, it's the funnest press conference. It's the most awkward press conference. It's the only press conference I know of where an NHL coach was fired, tries to sing Taylor Swift. Nobody gives him anything to work with there. And then just the timing of that, just for some random person to break in and shout that. Absolutely perfect. And he, uh, he lived up to the moment with the comeback for it. It's, it's the best. I'm sorry. It's the best. This might, it might be a cop there you out. Go. She's an off ice <laughs> moment, but I'm sorry. It's the best moment in hockey history for me. <laughs> That's incredible. I love that one so much. All right. So that was a great question, though. I, I, I like that one a lot. I love these two because I'm such a new hockey fan that so much of this is like I've never heard any of these stories before I'm over here googling some of the names yes. and kind of like trying to place them in history and kind of adding it to what I've learned and um, I just th thank you um, it's it's so good and I think now zooming in just a little bit um, what's been your favorite moment in covering the Kraken so far? All right. Should I take the lead on this one this time? Yeah, you okay. start this one, Dylan. All right. My favorite one came earlier this season, and that was being in Los Angeles for that 9-8 win against the Kings. 9-8 overtime win against the Kings. Uh, sitting up there in the press box, just everybody, just surrounded by all sorts of people, whether it was reporters, whether it was the front office staff for the Kings, like everybody, and just nobody could figure out what was going on. Nobody had had anything to, to say about it. Like at some point it all went silent. And then at other times, everyone's just laughing hysterically as all these goals are getting scored. It was the most unique thing I've ever been a part of uh, from the media side of things. But yeah, it was just such a wild moment. Try just sitting there. And as you're struggling to come up with adjectives to describe like, you know, the eighth goal that you've seen in the last 25 minutes, you've missed two more <laughs> goals and everybody struggle with that. It was just such a unique moment. Uh, I just don't, think anything else can come to that kind of level of like hilarity and like adrenaline and all of that wrapped up into one thing it was it was special <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm, I remember that night where I had you do the the goal tweets too, and I, I felt bad for throwing that on you with them being that many. Um, man, it feels like you go to all the coolest games, even though I go to many more games than you do. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I, I always think of fan appreciation night, the, the final home game of the season last year, and it just felt like this great celebration and, and a great kind of party just for, for all of us to celebrate that year that had happened, even with all the losing, like all the friends that we had met, all the people that, that we'd gotten to know, um, you know, seeing some members of the community like Maya get the jersey off the players back. Like there was so much cool stuff there for everybody, getting to meet some people I hadn't hadn't met yet in person. Um, so, I mean, that's one that I think of. And the other one also was uh, at the start of this season, the the media clinic. And this is a very like tailored toward me thing because I always love to get on the ice. I love playing hockey. Uh, the one thing I love more than watching hockey is playing hockey and to get to be out there on the ice, doing a little skills clinic um, coached by Dave Haxtell, um, which <laughs> was just an amazing experience. That was a surprise. They didn't tell us that ahead of time. So to see Dave Haxtell step out on the ice, he's like, yeah, I'm going to be the one leading you through drills today. Um, that was pretty cool. And I mean, very nice of him to do that. Um, yeah, just getting to do that with all the media, getting to score some goals on, on Darren Brown, Sound of Hockey, you know, build those media rivalries. It was really fun. Yeah. What uh, kind of coach was Haxtell during that event? You know, um, he said he was going to bag skate us at the very start. I was ready for it, but he didn't end up doing it. I, I think he, he was he was very nice about it. Very encouraging type of coach. Um, you know, I, I think understanding that we were going to be, you know, kind of asking him questions and pressing him on stuff the whole rest of the season. You want to, you know, create a good impression there to start. Um, but yeah, he was he was very nice about things. And um, yeah, he was he was fun, too. I mean, like that's one side of Hackstall that I think the fans don't really get to see all that often. He's got a really great sense of humor. Like some of the funniest things I've heard from this entire time, two seasons doing this job were things that Dave Hackstall has said. So, I mean, just really fun, lighthearted. It's before the season started. So, um, yeah, he was great. Does he have like a dry sense of humor? Yes. Yes. It's a dry sense of humor, which is exactly what I love. Um, like that's that's my go-to. He's so funny. So I guess the follow-up to that is who has a drier sense of humor, Haxtell or Adam Larson? <laughs> oh, that's tough. Oh, that man. is really tough. I, I, you know, like I was going to say it, it, I was, I don't know, maybe I, I, I think just, I want to say, I oh, want to say Haxtell. Well, I was going to say, this is the problem. Like Haxtell uses it a lot more frequently, but mm -hmm. like that, that kind of makes it more special when Larson does give you something, you know? Yeah, he'll drop like a one word thing as like Iki's trying to do the, you know, the Rubik's here's nerd <laughs> as he's walking by little things like that. Um, you know, Hackstall talk like his with during the dad's trip a, a few weeks ago, you know, he's like, yeah, my father in law's here. Like, I haven't seen him since he got in the building. Like, I don't know, uh, just little things like that or he'll throw it into to a presser. Oh, I love it. I'm so I'm always so jealous about that kind of stuff with RJ there. <laughs> Sorry, Dylan. Nah, it's all right. Um, but yeah, another good, another good question. You're good. At yeah, this. these are some good questions. You're good yeah, at this. gotta get you in front of Hackstall. I know, right? <laughs> Can I just tag out? Have you ask him some questions? Maybe in a couple years after I've watched y'all's, you know, all of y'all's various contents uh, and learned a lot more <laughs> about hockey, then it would be a bit more appropriate. But um, gosh, I think my next question is people are often talking about how much fun this organization is. And like, I love that because at the end of the day, this is a job for a lot of players. Like it's an incredible job and they're doing this kind of amazing thing, but it's still a day in the office. Mm -hmm. And I know I've had jobs where it was not fun and I've had jobs where it was fun. And it's just always such a better situation overall when people can enjoy showing up and doing it with the people they're with. So what do you think it is that kind of makes this organization special? It's a good question because there is something special about this organization, RJ. And this is yeah. something that maybe like I have a different take on just because I go to the more of the away games. So I get to see how the other organizations kind of operate behind the scenes. I can kind of be around more of their front offices and stuff, um, walking around and, and, and things. And I and I think and this this is what I would say about like any sort of job scenario, because like I've been in, you know, in offices where it's not a fun time and, and times where it is. And the bottom line is I think when you're just an organization built around good people and people who are just good human beings, 
I think that has that trickle down effect of, of everybody feeling maybe a little bit safer, a little bit more relaxed and feeling like they can express themselves and they can have fun and that you can have, you know, as long as everybody's doing their job and they're, you know, they're putting in the time, all that kind of stuff that you can have fun. And I think that that's a big thing with this organization. And that's something that starts with, you know, somebody like Ron Francis, I think about right away. We just talked about, you know, Hackstall's sense of humor, Ron Francis, maybe not as much a sense of humor all the time, but he's just someone that is always really really nice he has held an elevator door for me you know what i mean like he is just somebody who if you're walking around he'll you know wait for you to pass he'll, he'll give you the right away or he'll you know like i said hold an elevator door for you and i think when you have kind of like the head person in charge of like hockey decisions setting that tone just by being who he is which is just a good person i think that trickle down effect is really really huge and i think that you know so many people within the kraken organization you know everybody that i've um, been able to interact with they've all been that way they're just good people and i always just walk away having positive experiences with them and that then you know furthers me having a passion about the team and wanting to have fun around the team and all of that stuff. And I got to think for the people who work under them all the way down to the players that that has that same effect. Yeah, well, well said. And I mean, that was going to be my first point, just the emphasis on character, like the fact that there's really no bad people all the way from the top down. And, and that's kind of what happens when you've got good people who emphasize character and class at the top and they hire good people and they hire good people it kind of works its way down. Um, and the other thing I think that I'd add to that is, is a lot of that was kind of formed last season a little bit too. You have good people there, but last season in a lot of ways, the way it went, I think actually helped. Like the losing, of course, was quite depressing of course, you know, for all of us, for everyone involved, the players, you know, maybe more than anyone, but, I think ultimately, like in a locker room situation like that on a team, you have to know that the guy next to you has your back and isn't going to turn on you if things get bad or, you know, isn't going to get annoyed with things. And they experienced some of the worst, you know, losing that the league could throw at them. And they stayed a tight knit group and you know they stayed together and they continued to fight and they continued to battle for each other. And I think that proved everything, you know, to everyone that, look, we are a team, we're together here. And I think it was kind of a bonding experience too. Um, and you had to find ways to have fun too and to like not take yourself too seriously and, and the whole thing too seriously or else you were just going to have a miserable time all year. It kind of became clear after a little bit that like, all right, if we don't find a way to just relax a little bit and have fun, we're not going to have like this season is just going to be the most miserable thing ever. So I think everyone kind of found ways to do that. And then when you do have success this year, I mean, everyone's just having a blast because, oh, man, look how much better it is than last year. Yeah, that would do it. <laughs> that would do it, too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I think the natural follow up to that question is, who do you think is having the most fun on the team? Well, you're going to have to take that one, RJ. You see them more. I know, I know. This is this is great getting to, you know, go into the locker room and, and spend time around the players. The first name that actually came to mind, I just did this like in my head scan of the locker room and just imagined it all there like it usually is. And who's having the most fun? I've got to say Adam Larson. Like, yes, really? he has so much yes. fun. Yes, you yes. wouldn't think so. Yes. You wouldn't think so. But he he is joking around with the guys in the room. He's like, again, the, the smiles are rare in front of the camera, but he is always having a good time when, when he's out there, like on the ice or off the ice. It's, it's kind of fun to watch too. And again, he's got that sense of humor too. He enjoys making all the other guys laugh and just, you know, be in that way. It's awesome. And, and the other one I'd say like Vince Dunn, that deep hair has so much fun. <laughs> Very interesting. I'm surprised it's not Morgan Geeky, given Morgan Geeky's always out here talking about Pizza Hut, Mario Kart, all that stuff. Okay, he has a lot of fun, too. Like, I, he was definitely a contender there. Really, anyone on the fourth line, too. Like, Geeky, Donato, Sprong, like, anyone who's rotated in that spot, they give each other crap a lot of the time, but it's always in a super fun way. Mm. Um, you know, like this Sprong's chirps, like, oh, he's a Harvard guy. He thinks he knows stuff, you know, all that. It's it's great stuff, um, you know, to hear. And they definitely have a good time. And then the other side of that also, well, not other side, but like the, the gratitude type of fun, they're just so grateful and happy to be here. I think Ryan Donato and Ellie Tolvanen, like they're just so happy to be 
part of the Seattle Kraken. And you saw that with Ryan Donato last season and when he re-signed here, it probably took less money to do so. And of course, Ellie Tolvin and just being grateful that like hockey is fun again. Um, so, so those two, I feel like are worth a mention. And then finally, Oliver Bjorkstrand. I mean, he just seems to be having fun every day of his life. He's just such a happy-go-lucky guy. <laughs> so that, that's kind of what I've observed. Awesome. That's that's good stuff. I love I love hearing about that behind the scenes stuff. Too. Any surprises there for you, Sarah? <laughs> I think Adam Larson, uh, my partner's going to love hearing that his jersey that he wears to every game is an Adam Larson jersey. He's his favorite player. He loves uh, Dylan when you're wearing the the bespoke D to B. Um, we love it whenever there's. Um, interviews with Adam Larson after games and we're kind of like okay what's the vibe tonight how deep is the V um it's like he's he's um and his dry wit really resonates with Jeremy so I think he's gonna really love that in particular um I don't think I'm not surprised about the others but I also some of that's because the media team does such a good job sharing mm -hmm. stuff and like yep. seeing the kinds of speeches the guys give when they hand over the hat or, you know, some of these other marketing things they've put out, like it's so much fun to watch them. But Adam Larson being the number one, just that makes me so happy. I, me too. Me too. <laughs> He'd never let you know it, but he's having the most fun out there. Oh, that's, that is fantastic. Uh, we got time for, you know, one or two, two more questions. You got anything good for us here? I have one more, and it's because we are, I don't want to jinx it, but coming up on playoff time. Mm -hmm. So this is my first time following a team this closely. I've never really watched playoff hockey before. So what are some of the like key changes that happen, or rather key changes that teams make in the way that they play when they go from regular season to the playoffs? Oh, geez, we were just right. talking about fun, and I feel like that goes out the window because everybody's all business. <laughs> it, it's true. There is definitely a, a switch flipped that you're starting to see already, like with Hackstall not really giving out the lineups and, and just being a little more kind of buttoned down recently. So that already starts a little bit before the playoffs. But that's a really good question because there are a lot of big changes that happen when you get into playoff hockey. I think we like probably want to do like a podcast or some, some whole yeah. long thing about it too because I feel like we need to kind of prepare newer fans for this who haven't experienced it themselves like it's it's going to be a wild ride i'm kind of jealous of you getting to experience it for the first time i'll never really get that again um but uh dylan like what, what comes to mind first for you with the changes in playoffs how much more physical the game gets and and it's just anytime somebody has the opportunity to hit somebody they're going to take the opportunity to hit them and it's not just going to be like oh i'm going to kind of like bump you into the boards it's i'm going to try to finish my check by going through you and that's just the mentality everyone has all the time and it just becomes so much more physical the the how loud it is to be at a playoff game just because of all the bodies being <laughs> slammed into boards and watching that that vibration shake down the glass all the different panels and everything that's always the first thing that comes to mind for me when when playoff hockey gets talked about yeah, it's this real battle of attrition that the hits add up over the course of a playoff series and teams and players know that. Um, so they're going to try and, and that's the thing. Guys will also play injured. That's that's the big difference. And, you know, it's not always the best thing. You know, we, we kind of criticize the culture there. But again, players know that if you can kind of give a guy a bruise or a bump in game one, that's going to really affect how he's able to play in game five or six. Like that's something they're aware of and they're kind of trying to do. I think also in general, every shift just matters so much. Like you, you take the most, think of the most intense shifts you've seen in the regular season, like last minute of a tie game or teams just trying to get back into it. It's like that every single shift. There is not a single shift off. It's like 110% all 60 minutes or more of the game. Uh, and then potentially for overtimes too. And, and multiple overtimes. Uh, that's the other thing too. I mean, the first, multi overtime game we get at climate pledge arena is just going to be a crazy experience uh you know i hope we're, we're both there to experience it um but yeah those are some some oh, sorry all th i hope all three of us are there to experience <laughs> it sorry dylan oh, um, so good. but uh yeah that's one thing that i thought of and then also 
like from a fan perspective too, like the rivalries get turned up to 11 um, with whoever, whatever team you're facing in the playoffs, that's how real rivalries get started. There's been a lot of talk in, you know, crack and circles. Oh, who's our first rival? And it's all kind of been a little trivial. I know there's some hate with the Canucks for the Tyler Myers thing and everything, but it's going to pale in comparison to whatever happens in this first playoff series. That's where the real rivalries are going to start. And also the whole league watches all your games. Like it's, it's, front page hockey news around you know the united states and canada anything that happens in your game so i don't know that's kind of what, I, what came to mind for me that's a that's a good one to bring up because yeah i we've talked about it before right west coast hockey isn't the most talked about all the time but the the time that it really gets you know paid attention to i mean this is the time of year where people will stay up till you know midnight watching watching the west coast games and sometimes from that uh it's the last thing on your mind next morning you wake up it's the first thing on your mind because it was the last thing you watched and and it they, it's when the west coast kind of finally gets to shine in the larger hockey community and so yeah i'm really looking forward to um everybody finding and discovering the Seattle Kraken for a lot of the reasons that we talked about throughout this whole podcast. We've, we've given many different reasons why the Seattle Kraken are this like amazing organization. Uh, and it's a real bummer that, you know, through most of the hockey season, nobody else really gets to know that or experience that. Mm. Uh, and the playoffs are going to be a great time for the Seattle Kraken to be able to kind of show off to a, a broader audience. And I'm really excited for that myself personally. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, <laughs> you, you got me thinking about the playoffs. Can't come soon enough. I know it's gonna be so much fun. It's gonna be so much fun. Uh, just like this has been a ton of fun. I want to thank you, Sarah, so so much for for being a part of this. Uh, this was a great episode of Release the Fans, and I want to remind everybody: if you want to be a part of this Release the Fans podcast, gotta check us out over at Patreon.com/slash Emerald City Hockey. Once a month, we randomly select a member of our Terror of the Deep tier over there on Patreon, and Get to join us on here on Release the Fans. Give your hockey story. Talk about the Seattle crack in your, on your side of things. And then also flip the tables and ask us any questions you want to ask. Thank you so much for joining us, Sarah. Anything you want, anything you want to shout out or anything on the way out of here? I think just thank you for having taught me so much about hockey, for helping me fall deeper in love with the Seattle Kraken and our organization and just with hockey as a sport and as a game. And I'm really looking forward to April, yeah. May. Yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, yeah. maybe even maybe June. June. Maybe. Maybe June. I'm really <laughs> looking forward to the spring. <laughs> yes. Very go. good. Very good. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and we will see you all next time. Bye.